from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So Yusef Kuminyaka has published 13 books of poems, including Neon Vernacular, which won the Pulitzer Prize, and his most recent collection, The Chameleon Couch. He has also received two NEA Literature Fellowships. I first met him about 15 years ago when I was in my mid-20s and I was just starting to study the craft of poetry seriously and I went to his workshop at the Indiana University Writers Conference and I still remember he'd sit there, he'd look at your poem, he'd lean back slightly, look at you and say, hmm, soul, that's a hard word to get into a poem and you quickly learned that you really needed to be precise in the language that you were going to use if you wanted to write a good poem. He also would take the same measured look at your line breaks and make you consider them and reconsider them. And I think those two things really speak to his work as a poet, that absolute mastery of language and nuance in the service of the image, and that keen technical craftsmanship that allows him to break your heart with every single line break that turns each line into its own bar of music. Yet, even the gravest poems have a sense of play, of that improvisation of jazz, so you find yourself not merely reading the poem, but kind of slow dancing your way through each of them. And as for what he writes about, well, let me let him tell you, as he wrote in his essay, Shape and Final Equilibrium. I write about whatever captures my imagination, anything that touches me with significance, philosophy, psychology, nature, culture, folklore, history, sex, science, concerns from the gut level to the arcane. And yes, jazz as a necessary bomb moves through all these aspects of our daily lives. I present Yusef Kumanyaka. It's great uh, to be here. Um, I'm going to start with a poem entitled Requiem. And I'm going to say that there's a poem still in progress. This is the first 40 some odd lines. So, when the strong and holy high winds whiplash over the soul of marshlands, eaten back to a sigh of salt water, the Crescent City was already shook down to a pylons. Her floating ribs, her spleen and backbone left trembling, and the old world facades and postmodern lethargy lost to waterlogged memories and quick claim deeds exposed for all eyes, damnable gaze, plumb lined and heart throb, ballast and water tabor, already the last ghost song of the Choctaw and the Chippewa, was long gone no more than a drunken curse among oak and sweet gum leaves, a tally of broken treaties and absences, echo and cries of birds over the barrier islands inherited by the repentance manned Scalawag and King Cotton, and already the sky were falling in on itself, calling like a cloud of seagulls gone ravenous as the gulf, reclaiming its ebb and flow chart, while the wind banged on shutters and unhanged doors from their frames and unshangled the low ridge roofs while the believers hum precious Lord and deep river as the horsehair plastered walls gallop along with the surge. Already folklore began to rise up from the barret lallygag and sluice Tossing beneath the big easy, rolling between and through itself, caught and some downward tug and turn like a world of love affairs backed up in a stall inlet. Like a world of love affairs backed up in a stall inlet, a knelt down army of cypress, a testament to how men dreamt land out of water where bedrock 
was only the heart's bump and grind, its deep, dark churn and acceleration, blows it down to those unmoored timbers, already nothing but water, mumbling as the great eye lingered on the question, then turned the gauzy genitalia of Bacchus and Zulu left dangling from magnolias and rain trees already. I'd sort of like to skip around here a bit. Um, when eyes are on me, I'm a scrappy old line who's wandered into a Christian square, quavering with centuries of forged bells. The cobblestones make my feet ache. I walk big shouldered, my head raised proudly. I smell the blood of a king. The citizens can only see a minotaur in a maze. I know more than a lion should know. My roar goes back to the Serengeti, to when a savanna was craggy eyes, but now it frightens only pigeons from a city stoop. They believe they know my brain's contours and grammar. Don't ask me how I know the signs engraved on a sundown, the secret icons behind a gaze. I wish their crimes hadn't followed me here. I can hear their applause in the dusty citadel. I know what it took to master the serpent at will, the crossbow and spinal tap. Once I was a leopard beside a stone gate. I'm a riddle to be unraveled. I am and I am not. When their eyes are on me, I become whatever's judged badly. I circle the park, hunger shapes my keen sense of smell, a lifetime ahead. They will follow my paw prints till they're lost and snow at dust. If I walk in circles, I hide from my shadow. They plot stars to know where to find me. I am a prodigal bird perched on the peak of a god house. I have a message for fate. The sunlight has shown me the guns, and their beautiful sons are deadly. <laughs> Blue dementia. In the days when a man could hold a swarm of words inside his belly, nestled against his spleen, singing. In the days of night riders, when life tongue to read till blues and sorrow song call out of the deep night, another man done gone, another man done gone. In the days when one could lose oneself all up inside love that way, then bone on the bone, till the gods cried out in someone's sleep. Today, already I've seen three dark-skinned men discussing the weather with demons and angels, gazing up at the clouds, squinting down into iron grates along the fire streaks of luminous encounters. I double-check my reflection in plate glass and wonder, am I passing another lucky Thomason, a Marin Brown, cornered by blue dementia? Another dark-skinned man who woke up dreaming one morning and then walked out of himself dreaming. Did this one dare to step on a crack and a sidewalk to turn a midnight corner and never come back whole? Or did he try to stare down a look that shove a blade into his heart? I mean, I also know something about night riders and cat guard. Yeah, honey, I know something about talking with ghosts. I should say that there's a touch of blues underneath things. Um, I said I wouldn't write about Vietnam anymore, but here's another poem. It's entitled Grenade. I should say that 
Grenada is about um, 14 or 15 young black men in Vietnam who threw themselves on grenades. There's no rehearsal to turn flesh into dust so quickly. A hair trigger, a cock hammer in the brain, a split second between man and infamy. It lands on the ground. A few soldiers duck and the others are caught in a half run and one throws himself down on the grenade. All the watches stop. A flash, smoke, silence. The sound fills the whole day. Flesh and earth fall into the eyes and mouths of the men. A dream trapped in midair. They touch their legs and arms, their groins, ears and noses sound. What happened? Some are crying. Others are laughing. Some are almost dancing. Someone tries to put the dead man back together. He just dove on the damn thing, sir. A flash, smoke, silence, the day blown apart. For those who can walk away, what is their burden? Shreds of flesh and bloody rags gathered up and stuffed into a bag. Each breath belongs to him. Each song, each curse, every prayer is his. Your body doesn't belong to your mind and soul. Who are you? Do you remember the man left in the jungle? The others who owe their lives to this phantom, do they feel like you? Would his loved ones remember him with that little park and stature erected and his name didn't exist? And does it enlarge their lives? Do you wish he had lied down in that closed coffin, not wander the streets or enter your bedroom at midnight? The woman you love, should never understand who would. You remember what he used to say. If you give a kike too much strain, it'll break free. That unselfish certainty, but you can't remember when you began to live his unspoken dreams. I'm going to read some, some new poems, fairly new poems. Um, and they'll probably go across the map. Um, the Blue Hour. A procession begins in the blue black gratitude between worlds and the rebirth jazz band marches out of what little light is left among the magnolia blossoms. Step here, and one steps off the edge of the world. Step there, and one enters the unholy hour where one face bleeds into another as a horse-drawn bug buggy rolls out of the last century and the red-eyed 17-year locust grows deeper into the old hushed soil. Lean this way and a blue insinuation takes over the body. Step here, and one shadow stops digging its grave to gaze up at the even star. Or, at this moment, less than a half step between night and day, bird houses stand like totems against the sky. A flicker of wings and eyes, mocking birds arrive with stolen songs and cries, their unspeakable, unspeakable lies and omens, as if they are some minor gods, only true instrument and broken way on stage in the indigo air. They come with uh -huh, and yeah, a few human words to ghost white boxes on 12 foot poles to where each round door hole is a way in and a way out of oblivion. <laughs> Seven Mysteries of the Platypus. She tries to hide in a swish of wet grass because she remembers the first man like a wound 
and old scar, a howl in the hush. Her skin is too rough for the marketplace. Otherwise, she would have fallen under a bullet or knife. She came from an old world, a prototype, the first shimmer pieced together by a prankish god, that first moment of light seeping from the cave, an oaf ridden on her back by the edge of a flood. Before she slipped from the egg, she knew a human face would make her heart explode into a clutch of stars. Some of these poems are under the title of Night Animals. Skulking across the snow. The shadow knows, okay, but what is this? The travels tell curl like a question mark, a tribe on her back. The snow falls among headstones, the fat flakes curtain three worlds. In southern folklore, they exhume the old world before skulking out into a new frontier of city lights. They live by playing dead, bounty of lunacy, bounty of what it seems and other extremes. No. I'm not talking about lines drawn or lines stolen into a rock and roll song. No, arch sentimentalist. I'm not speaking of moonlight or pale girl of wonderlust and a desert. But that's not a bad guess. I'm lost in your obscure imagination. Speaking of the dead, you know, Yates also knew a little something about the occult. Sleepwalking is another story. Yes, the blank space says, wake up knucklehead and listen to this. You might be getting on to something here. If I had different skin, would you read me differently? Would you see something in the snow that isn't in the snow, something about approaching genius? Would you press your nude body against the pages and try reading something into the life of the speaker? Would you nibble at the edges of my nightmares and wake with the taste of death in your mouth? Or would you open your eyes lost in a field of hyson? Well, on a night like this, Snow has fallen into my dreams. A lithium or a horse could be a clue, but not necessarily so. Or think of the two men raising their dueling pistols, the years of silence between them, Alexander Pushkin falling into the January whiteness of history. Okay, um, going a slightly different direction. The title of this poem is Thanks. Thanks for the tree between me and a sniper's bullet. I don't know what made the grass weigh seconds before the Viet Cong raised his soundless rifle. Some voice always fallen, telling me which foot to put down first. Thanks for deflecting the ricochet against that anarchy of dust. I was back in San Francisco, wrapped up in a woman's wild colors, causing some dark bird's love call to be shattered by daylight when my hands reached up and pulled a branch away from my face. Thanks for the vague white flower that pointed to the gleaming metal reflecting how it is to be broken like mist over the grass as we played some deadly game for blind gods. What made what made me spot the monarch on a single thread tied to a farmer's gate, 
holding the day together like an unfingered guitar string is beyond me. Maybe the hills grow weary and leaned a little in the heat. Again, thanks for the dud hand grenade toss at my feet outside July. I'm still falling through its silence. I don't know why the intrepid sun touched the bayonet, but I know that something stood among those lost trees and move only when I move. Facing it. My black face fades, hiding inside the black granite. I said I wouldn't, damn it, no tears. I'm stone, I'm flesh. My cluttered reflection eyes me like a bird of prey, a profile of night standing against morning. I turn this way, the stone lets me go. I turn that way. I'm inside the Vietnam Veterans Memorial again, depending on the light to make a difference. I go down to 58,022 names, half expecting to find my own in litters like smoke. I touch the name Andrew Johnson. I see the booby trap's white flash, name shimmer on a woman's blouse. But when she walks away, the names stay on the wall. Dress strokes flash, a red bird's wings cutting across my stare, the sky a plane in the sky, a white vet's image floats closer to me than his eyes look through mine. I'm a winter. He's lost his right arm inside the stone. In the black mirror, a woman's trying to erase names. No, she's brushing a boy's hair. I think I'm going to read a poem with a slightly different rhythm. Uh, let me look and see what time we This is a performance poem. It's written for the performance poets at Harrow Park Hotel. Harrow Park Hotel, the first place I read in Sydney, Australia, so long ago. Um, the need got to be so deep, words can answer simple questions all night long, no stumble off the tongue and color the air indigo. So deep fragments of gut and flesh came to the song. You gotta get into it. So deep salt crystallizes on eyelashes. The need gotta be so deep. You can bump up ghosts and not feel broken to you're no more than a half ounce of gold and painful brightness. You gotta get into it. Blow that saxophone so deep all the sex and dope in this world can erase your need to howl against the sky. The need gotta be so deep you just can't wiggle your hips and rise up of it. Out of the like chaos in the cosmos, modern man in a pepper pot, you gotta get hooked into every hungry groove. So deep the bomb locked in rust, opens like a fist into it, into it. So deep rhythm is pre-memory. The need gotta be basic animal need to see and know the terror we are made of, honey. Cause if you wanna dance this boogie, be ready to let the devil use your head for a drum. This next poem is a med meditation on Bogalus, one, one of my early um, imagistic moments that I sort of took away with me in my psyche. It's uh, called Venus's Fly Traps. I am five, wading out into deep sunny grass, unmindful of snakes in yellow jackets, out to the yellow flowers, quivering in sluggish heat. Don't mess with me, because I have my Lone Ranger six-shooter. I can hurt you with questions like silver bullets. The tall flowers in my dreams are big as the first state bank. Need all the people except the ones I love. They have women's names with mouths like we're birds. They have women's names with mouths where babies come from. I'm five. I'll dance for you if you close your eyes, no peeping through your fingers. I don't suppose to be this close to the tracks. One afternoon I saw what a train did to a cow. Sometimes I stand so close, I can see the eyes of men hiding in boxcars. Sometimes they wave and holler 
for me to get back, I laugh when trains make the dogs howl, their ears hurt. I also know bees can't live without flowers. I wonder why daddy calls mama honey. All the bees in the world live in little white houses, except the ones in these flowers, all sticking sweet inside. I wonder what death tastes like. Sometimes I toss the butterflies back into the air. I wish I knew why. The music in my head makes me scared. But I know things I don't suppose to know. I could start walking and never stop. These yellow flowers go on forever, almost to Detroit, almost to the sea. My mama says I'm a mistake, that I made her a bad girl. My playhouse is underneath our house, and I hear people telling each other secrets. My father's love letters. On Fridays, he'd open a can of Jack's after coming home from the mill and asked me to write a letter to my mother who sent postcards of desert flowers taller than men. He would beg, promising never to beat her again. Somehow, I was happy she had gone and sometimes wanted to slip in a reminder how Mary Lou Williams poked out some moonbeams never make the swelling go down. His carpenter's apron, always budged with old nails, a claw hammer, looped at his side, extension cords coiled around his feet. Words rolled from under the pressure of my ballpoint. Love, baby, honey, please. We sat in the quiet brutality of voltage meters and pipe threaders lost between sentences. The gleam of a five pound wedge on the concrete floor pull a sunset through the doorway of his tool shed. I wonder if she laughed and held him over a gas burner. My father could only sign his name, but he'd look at blueprints and see how many bricks formed each wall. This man who stole roses and hyson for his yard would stand there with eyes closed and fists ball, laboring over a simple word, almost redeemed by what he tried to say. I suppose I'll just read a few last poems, and then we sort of open things up, uh, okay? Ultra Drum. Gazelle, I kill you for your skin's exquisite touch. For how easy it is to be nailed to a board with a raw as white busher paper. Last night, I heard my daughter praying for the meat here at my feet. You know it was an anger that made me stop my heart to the hammer fell. Weeks ago, I broke you as a woman once shattered me into a song beneath her weight before you slouched into that grassy hush. But now I'm tightening lashes, shaping hard as if around the ribcage stretched like five bow strings. Ghosts cannot slip back inside a body's drum. You've been seasoned by wind, dust, and sunlight. Pressure can make everything whole again. Brass nails tack into the ebony wood. Your face has been carved five times. I have to drive trouble from the valley, trouble in the hills, trouble on the river too. There's no coal enough, palm wine, fish, salt, or calabash. Ka a doom. Ka a doom. Ka a doom, a doom. Now, I've beaten a song back into you. Rise and walk away like a panther. <laughs> Perhaps um, we are open open things up for, um, for questions, I think. And maybe I'll read a few last poems at the end. How's that for strategy? Okay. Oh, do you want me to answer questions? 
question. I'm Marilyn Crowe, and I love your poem, My Father's Love Letter, that my cousin Jane Ivory reads me to. And I'm wondering, you keep reading the war poems, did that help save your sanity after the war, writing poetry? Um, you know, I have very systematically uh, written around that experience. It took me about 14 years to write about my experiences, observations in Vietnam. Um, I realized I had internalized all the images as such. Maybe it was a kind of attempt to let go of those images, but not in a prescribed um, way. Um, I surprised myself by writing about Vietnam. So it's difficult to trans to answer that question directly. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Uh, there's the idea that uh, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Some of what you wrote and some of what you read today uh, you know, incorporated the idea of the gaze. Uh, talk a little bit about how, how the gaze works as a framework for you in terms of expressing things poetically. OK. That's a very interesting question, the gaze. Um, I suppose I could say this is sort of a curse, uh, but maybe it's a blessing as well. I grew up in a small town. Uh, my rituals, early rituals, were to venture out into nature. And that took a very decisive confrontation with nature in a certain sense because I saw things that were very playful and magical, but also knew that nature could be the, the, the opposite of that. Uh, so I think perhaps that stimulated the idea of the gaze. Um, but the gaze can also be um, a kind of confrontation. I define poetry as celebration and, conf and confrontation. Um, when we witness something, we are, re are we responsible for what we witness? That, that's an ongoing um, existential question. Uh, perhaps we are. And perhaps there's a kind of daring, a kind of necessary, energetic um, questioning. It, because often I say it's not what we know, it's what we can risk discovering. And perhaps that's what the poem is about, that there's a dialogue. There's a dialogue with extended possibility. I hope that, yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, my question is with regards to the revision process. How yes. do you know when a poem is done? <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, you know, um, Yates talks about here in the poem, click. Um, I like to say I, I leave a little door left, slightly open. Um, and the reason for that is that the poem, I feel, shouldn't be an ad for an emotion. Um, and we get to the bottom of the poem, and, the, and that should propel us back up to the beginning of the poem. That's how I like reading poems again and again. And consequently, we as complex organisms, we're constantly changing. So we're coming to the poem in a different way. We're, and maybe that's what Emily Dickinson talks about when she's t the, the slant. Um, so one doesn't purposely attempt to resolve the poem, if, possi if, if possibly, that so you end on an image. Any other questions? Maybe I'll go back uh, to some of these newer poems. How are we doing? Good. Another kind of night. Slowly, the remembered trees a 900-year-old sky, the call of birds, a mambo snake 
snoozing beside a stone, a mast tall as a man's an hour before sunset, jackals holding the ceremony at the edge of a lake. It all fades into rancor. But my own face is still a boy's, losing its features down there where everything is one godforsaken animal wounded in the nameless dark. All the faces are one constellation where the dead interrogate the living. The motion of the sea beneath, God of moonlight, God of sharks patrolling the schooner, and God of laughter on the deck. Hyenas on a hilltop, are you still trying to tell me something about mercy? In this other night, riding the trade winds, the waves underneath the creaking eternity, we are nothing but cargo, moans in the belly of riven leviathan, wind toss, the sails toned down to tatters, beached up on white sand, stretching out against sky for centuries, seagulls calling to birth cries in the new world. I like to write odes, the moments of celebration, um, Ode to the Oud. I think it has a lot to do with the fact I, I, love, the, I love the music that's, in, that's in, in the Oud. I suppose the possibility of music. Ode to the Oud. Gorge shape, muse swollen with wind and the mulberry. Tell me everything you are made of Little desert boat ara. Oblong box of bedding doves picking pomegranate seeds out of the air. You're the poet's persona, his double in the high priest's third chamber. Each string a litany of stars over the Sahara. Pear shaped traveler, strong but so light. Is there a wishbone pulling you together? I wish I knew how to open you up with an eagle's feather or a pick whittled from buffalo horn, singing alive the dust of Nubia. Rosewood season long ago, I wish I could close your 12 mouths with kisses. Tongue strung in a row I wish I can open every sound in you. Little ship of sorrow, bend your voice till the names of heroes or courtesans, birds and animals, prayers and love songs swum from your better belly. I envy one blessed to master himself by rocking you in his lonely arms. You know, I'm going to go back to that very first poem I, I read, Requiem, and I'm going to read the last lines. Um, I think there are many lines between the two sections, but uh, this is how it ends. And already a thick vein of ink widens into midnight, into daybreak, the wind walking Audubon's ghost through the almost gone scraggly grass out into the oily marsh bog where disappearing land begs no footprint out to where hard evidence rainbows up leaving thousands hurting to be counted as nothing more than sea turtle, eel, blind pelican, egret, mud puppy, crab, and already water wounds into a slush of uncountable small deaths moored in cypress, st stinking up springtime with a pestilence that goes back to the dark ages on harbors 
where boats sway in shifting light. The dead talking to us from a lost masterpiece. Asking, where is this? Somewhere we are forbidden to remember where scavengers are defeated by what they devour. And already from a mound down plums keep rising up through night and day, weeks and months, through animal cries and the language of robots where diving machines moonwalk, surging and falling like drowned shadows of carrier pigeons clouding the waves already. Night of the armadillo. You huddle into a shield, a breastplate, a whisper in the dark, summon your kind, your kin, one by one along the frontier, in your kingdom, errant night of undergrowth, even in your gut fear, you're already on the verge of a new border or at the edge before crossing into the interior of false prophecies. Desert blooms and berries fall into marshy hush around a shop curve. Planetary lights spring out of nothingness. How did you go wrong? With only blind faith and a dead star left in the eyes Where's North America? You've been around eons, not knowing when you left one age and entered another. But I found your Olympus of foolish odds in the modern world. Lovers and cars, delivery trucks, make leaves tremble along the roadside. If you know this little suitcase of guts and nails, you are still alive, even with your broken hinges. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I have time for one more question. No? Okay. Let me see if I can recite this poem off the top of my head. Ode to the Maggot. Brother of the blowfly and godhead, you work magic over battlefields and slabs of bad pork and flop houses. Yes, you go to the root of all things. You are sound and mathematical. Jesus Christ, you're merciless with the truth, ontological and lustrous. You cast spells on beggars and kings behind the stone door of Caesar's tomb, a split trench and a field of ragweed. No decree or creed can outlaw you as you take every living thing apart, little master of earth. No one gets to heaven without going through you first. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.